I would like to welcome you to the fifth UMD Environmental Justice and Health Disparities Symposium. As I said, I'm Dr. Shelby Wilson. I am an associate professor uh, here at Maryland. I'm also the director of the Program of Community Engagement in Environmental Justice and Health. The uh, purpose of that program is to really help bring together the folks when it comes to issues of environmental justice and environmental health disparities, uh, convening meetings, do educational workshops, and try to make sure that uh, stakeholders who are most impacted by those issues are getting access to resources, technical assistance, uh, policymakers to, to address those problems. Um, I want to do a couple quick announcements. Uh, we have a hashtag for this event. It's hashtag UMD uh, EJ Symposium. So for those of you who like to tweet and all that kind of stuff, get, get your tweet on, please. Uh, our Twitter, Twitter handle is at Siege Lab. Uh, this event, a uh, part of this event will be live streamed, so we're gonna have a keynote speaker uh, later this evening. Um, it's the eighth annual Siege keynote lecture. It'll be done by Mr. Mustafa Ali. Uh, yes, you can say woo! So many of you may know Mustafa. He's now a vice president um, with the National Wildlife Federation, and uh, the, his theme of his talk this evening will be uh, from surviving to thriving, really talking about uh, frontline environmental justice communities, and issues of climate justice and climate equity. Uh, I would like to thank uh, our numerous sponsors uh, for the support of this event this year. I'll go through the list uh, in the morning, and I may go through the list during lunch, and I'll go through the list again at night, because without you, this event would not be possible. So the Audubon National Society, the Center for Health, Environment, and Justice, uh, SRAP, Johns Hopkins Center for Livable Future, Chesapeake Bay Foundation, National Center for Smart Growth, Rachel Carson Council, Chispa, Maryland, uh, UMD School of Public Health, Maya, Choose Clean Water Coalition, uh, EIP, Environmental Technology Project, Sierra Club, thank you, Leslie, Earth Justice, Maryland Environmental Health Network, our Department of Sociology, uh, in, uh, Succinct, Namati, Columbia Reality Project, the School of Law, University of Maryland School of Law, um, and also the Union of Concerned Scientists. And um, we really do appreciate your support of this event. Uh, what I'd like to do before we uh, move to our plenary session, I'll introduce our, our panelists for that. I, I wanna set the stage for today. And on the morning of Earth Day, I just happened to be lazing about, as my uh, nine-year-old would say, she'll be here today my future EJ uh, activist, and I, I started writing a little speech. Some of you may, may have seen the speech on Facebook, but I think it's appropriate for me to read parts of the speech, if I can find it, to read parts of the speech today, just to give you a little bit of you know, background on why we're here, and then really talk about, oh, it's front and back. <laughs> Environmentalists, save paper. <laughs> I was looking for the second page. So I just really set up the day, and, and, and why, why are we here? So you've seen in the news uh, chemical leaks uh, that's, that happened in Houston. There was an explosion uh, of a plant, and was it Waukega, Illinois? Ethylene oxide issue. We just had a NEJAC meeting, National Environmental Justice Advisory Council meeting last week, talking about ethylene oxide. You, you saw the Crota uh, facility leak in Delaware. Uh, we, we've seen studies coming out that's, that they're talking about issues of environmental racism uh, in communities across the country. And I just want to say that, you know, we know this is happening, environmental racism. We know environmental classes is happening. The burden of pollution is disproportionately borne by different groups who've been marginalized. Black and brown communities in many cases. This is the new Jim Crow. Black and brown communities are used as sinks for pollution, and what's more egregious is the impacts of this pollution on unborn black and brown babies. How are you gonna put America first if you don't put your kids first, right? How are you gonna put America first if we don't put our kids first? Let's do more to address environmental justice from the environmental racism of pipelines and mining that impacts indigenous peoples, environmental classes of industrial animal agriculture, CAFOs, to environmental slavery, a goods movement, power plants, and landfills. What's going on down in Brandywine? Let's stand up to corporate imperialism and the systemic inequities built into environmental regulations, which seem to work or be enforced based on your phenotype. Y'all know what I mean, your color. 
okay? The color of your skin is the strongest predictor, and this is science right here, y'all. This is science. Strongest predictor if you'll be a host of industrial hazard that can pollute the air, water, and soil, releasing toxicants that can cause asthma, reduce your IQ, disrupt your neurons, mutate your DNA, and you get that to your kids. That's called epigenetics. An impact of developing fetus. Yes, Lord, we need a new Green Deal, which doesn't prioritize environmental issues based on the amount of green in your pocket. Hit your pockets around here. But prioritize the expansion of the green infrastructure and resources to communities impacted by environmental justice. Communities differentially at risk from climate change and climate related impacts, devastating hurricanes, terrible floods, inescapable fires. Let's remember that heat waves are hell for the poor and hell for the elderly. Too many people have been displaced by climate change just because they don't have the bank to escape flooded riverbanks. Y'all get that? We need a rebirth, a renewal, and revitalization of the human spirit, a reawakening of our shared humanity. See, I am black. See, I am brown. See, I am an other. See, I may come from a low wealth community. See, I may not have a lot of money, but see, I may not have a college degree, but by God, I am human, recognized by humanity. Environmental injustice happens because we don't value our fellow brothers and sisters. We don't value black and brown bodies, black and brown babies. That's the bottom line. There's no justice until there's just us in solidarity, fighting together against structural racism and all forms of bigotry and discrimination, including environmental apartheid. In thousands of communities across the country, environmental apartheid that is legal and is as American as apple pie. It is time to wake up. It is time to let's stand up. Let's breathe again, fresh air, without the billowing plumes of pollution from petrochemical facilities. And as my, my, my better half would say, she likes to call it pollutogens. She made up the word pollutogens, pollution sources. Y'all get that, pollutogens, okay. She gave a shout out to the missus. She'll be here later on today. Let's live again in homes without lead. Let's eat again food that is not pathogenic. Poisoned with pesticides, adulterated with additives, or coated with calories. Let's see again kids playing in parks, neighbors working together, enforcement of the Civil Rights Act. That's why we're here today. Title VI, y'all. Expansion of voter rights and protection, and the promulgation of new laws and regulations to give voice to the voiceless, empowerment to those without power, and hope to those who are hopeless. America, let's make Earth Day great again. I mean, I know it's we passed Earth Day, but y'all get the point. Let's make Earth Day great again. Y'all get that? Great just, just not for those with access, opportunity, and privilege, but all Americans, especially our brothers and sisters on the front lines of verbal injustice, on the front lines of perverse poverty politics. You need econ, that's a capital E-C-O-N, economic development, but instead you get a factory, you get a landfill, you get an incinerator, you get a highway, you get an industrial chicken farm, you get industrial hog farm. You get some type of hazard that leads to more suffering, hardship. Instead, you get cons. C-O-N-N-E-D, all caps. And you get the eventual development of cancers and other poor outcomes. You get premature mortality. Let's stop pain pimping America. Let's stop pimping the economic pain of our most vulnerable. Let's stop using our most vulnerable to host our pollution sources. Again, it's time for a renewal, a rebirth, a reawakening. We can do it. Let's make Earth Day great again. Let's make Earth Day great again. Yeah. Amen. Let's, uh, let's go. <laughs> See, I wrote that I was lazing about on Earth Day. Yeah, so, you know, let's try to get y'all ready for the day. You know, get in the spirit, in the spirit. So at this time, what I like to do, since I got myself riled up and ready to go, I'm up now. I actually woke up at 5 o'clock. I've been up for a while. So um, I want us to move into the plenary session. And so what we have as part of our plenary session, we're going to have uh, two sets. So the way this is go, we have two sets of panels. And we're going to have a Prince versus County focused panel to talk about environmental justice in, panel, uh, uh, in, in the county. And then we're going to have a, a sort of a state uh, focus panel to talk about state level issues 
and within Maryland, and we also have colleagues who are gonna talk about issues in Virginia, environmental justice issues in Virginia, and basically talk about what our council members are doing, what the county's doing, what the state level we're doing in Maryland, also Virginia, to address environmental justice. So I'd like to welcome our Prince Joseph County uh, panelists to the stage, please. And I will introduce you when, you when you get up here. Let's give them a round of applause, please. So even though we start a little bit late, we'll make sure these, these panels get their full time. We're gonna cut into the breaks a little bit, so we're gonna get us back on track. So, microphones. Hmm. Logistics. Where are the microphones at for the panel? Okay. Maybe I have to use the mics from down here. Hey, student helpers. To the front, get the mic. Jair, come this way. Y'all gonna have to pass the mic, okay. Come on, Jair. This is Jair one of our interns? Yeah, just take one of those. Is it live? So first, let me introduce our panelists for this morning session, plenary session. Uh, in no specific order, we have, um, well maybe in a specific order, we have Council Member Dini Tavares of District 2. She's committed to providing better public schools, safer and cleaner streets, and increased sustainable economic development. She's a passionate and strong advocate for social justice issues, seeking to improve the lives of working families in diverse communities. With over 15 years, 15 years experience as a policy analyst with, within local, state, and federal government, as well as international financial institutions such as the World Bank. Just want to go quickly so we can catch up a little bit. Our second panelist is Council Member Jolene Avi of District 5. Jolene Avi was elected to a first four-year term on the County Council in November 2018. She represents Council District 5 and serves in the Health, Human Services, and Public Safety Committee, which is the Vice Chair, the Planning, Housing, and Economic Development Committee, and the General Assembly Committee. She previously served as, in Annapolis as a delegate representing District 47 in the Maryland House, House of Delegates, and as chair of the Prince George County House delegation, she led to fight to correct the state education uh, funding formula. That's um, Council Member Julian Ivey. And uh, we have legislative and community liaison, Christopher Stevenson. Uh, Chris is a lifelong resident of Prince George's County with a passion for community organizing public service. His civic involvement began at a young age in his hometown by volunteering with the local American Legion. Uh, currently, Chris serves as the community organizer and liaison for Maryland State Senator. Was this correct? Am I saying the wrong thing? That's, right. That's my former job. That's the former job, so our bio is wrong. So your current job is the... Legislative community liaison. So it's legislative community liaison, yeah. We got a... For Calvin Hawkins, so, so thank you for that, Chris. Uh, what we wanna do and the time that y'all have is the first, each of you take five minutes to give an overview of what you or your uh, Calvin Hawkins is doing as it relates to environmental justice, uh, what your you know, thoughts are on environmental justice, what your plans are, initiatives, programs. And so each of you can take five minutes and then I'll uh, lead us through uh, a moderated discussion after that. Hi everyone, good morning. Uh, well, I'll, be, I'll start even with giving a little bit of a, a more in-depth background. I come from this as a chemist. I am someone who's worked at the EPA. I did, uh, I worked on Superfund sites and I worked on um, the Toxic Release Inventory Program under Lisa Jackson, who's the former head of the EPA under the Obama administration. Um, I then went to the World Bank where I worked on solid waste management issues in, in, in India. So those are kind of the skills that I bring to the table when I stepped into this role. And what I saw were, I, I represent the densest area of, of Prince George's County, which is 
basically a, a mile away from here, the Langley Park, Chillum area, city of Hyattsville, all the way to uh, Mount Rainier. And what I see here is that we have an issue of trash, um, density, educational attainment concerns, and those are the things that I've, um, air quality issues, and those are the things that I've addressed head on through my legislative, my legislative um, agenda, which I've, um, I've been at this position for five years, and we've been able to achieve many monumental legislations, not only that were passed, that were first passed at the county level, and then subsequently passed at the state level. So now we have issues like the styrofoam ban, it was first passed in Prince George's County, as well as the fracking ban, which was first start, which was first done in Prince George's County and then subsequently passed at the state level. So those are just small things, but I have other things that I've been able to work on successfully. And we'll, I'm sure we'll get into that a little deeper. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. And again, I'm Jolene Ivey on the County Council in District 5. And what I bring to the table is I am the mother of five sons. And when oh. you talk, talk about cumulative impacts, let me tell you what. The first son disrupts your life. <laughs> and then each one that adds to it, you look around the house and you think, how? And it's so similar to what we look at in our whole environment. It, you know, the first gas station, oh, it disrupts the neighborhood, but not the end of the world. By the time you get the fifth one in four blocks, you start to look around and say, what is going on? What are we going to do about this? I, I believe the five sons have brought more positive to the world than all the gas stations that are concentrated in a small area. And the thing that I know on the county council, the thing that we do most impactfully is to make decisions about land use. And it sounds kind of dry until you realize that that means you're deciding what can go where. And when you know what can go where, you know who's impacted by the what. So when I was running for this position, and actually when I was in the House of Delegates, I represented a uh, part of the same district, there's uh, some industrial areas that maybe they were out in the boondocks at some point, but at this point, uh, businesses and homes are near them. And when there was a concrete uh, batching plant proposed in Bladensburg, and I spoke to some of my um, people here today who were definitely leaders in the fight. Denise is here and she was like awesome leading the fight against the concrete batching plant. And I wholeheartedly threw myself into supporting blocking that. Now, the hard part for me is after I was elected, I learned that I was a person of record for that case. So therefore, I had to recuse myself from voting when it came to us. But the good news is that we have people like Denny Tavares, who is on the council, and unanimously, the council voted against allowing the concrete batching plan to move forward in Bladensburg. And getting to know Dr. Wilson over this period of time, I've learned so much more. And the most important thing you learn is who you can trust. And I can trust him. In fact, I don't think I needed that second cup of coffee this morning. I think I would have been just fine if I'd shown up with no coffee, because he definitely woke us up this morning. But one thing he's been leading the effort in is uh, having air monitors put in, eventually, we hope, around the county, Mm -hmm. so that we can actually know when we're making decisions about land use, we have to have data. If you don't know what the impact is of that next gas station or that next concrete batching plant, how can you in all good conscience approve it? So uh, Dr. Sokobi Wilson is leading the effort. I am supporting his efforts with hopefully financing, thanks Denny, <laughs> to actually pay for a lot of the work that needs to be done to start installing these air monitors around the county. So it'll start out as a pilot program and grow to cover the county. That'll give us the data we need 
So when projects come before us, we have something to actually look at to know what the environmental impacts are. So that's a, one of my big things I'm uh, taking on this year. And I'm really glad to have partners here who uh, are with me in the fight. So thank you so much. Thank you. It, it's, you go by Christopher or Chris? Uh, Chris is fine. So go ahead, Chris. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Christopher Stevenson. Again, I am the legislative and community liaison for at-large County Council Member Calvin Hawkins. Uh, if you all don't know, recently um, County Council Member Calvin Hawkins was elected to represent the entire county. So he is one of the at-large members as well as uh, Council Member Mel Franklin to represent Prince George's County. Um, with our office, we kind of take a forest outlook. We kind of see the forest and not just a tree. So we want to know what are all the issues that are going on in the county? Currently, the councilman uh, serves on the Prince George's County Environmental Justice Commission alongside with Dr. Wilson. That's one of his biggest priorities right now. The commission has three responsibilities, or three main responsibilities, I should say. Uh, one is to assess all the problems, environmental issues particularly, that are going on in the county. Uh, the second is to make recommendations, and the third is to report that back to the Prince George's County delegation, as well as the Maryland General Assembly in total. So right now, we, we're working with different agencies in the county, um, trying to assess all the different problems. It is a very big, a very large county, uh, so we keep that in mind. Uh, but right now, uh, the, the commission actually met uh, two times before uh, the end of the start of this year. Uh, they did have some goals that they set, uh, mainly prioritizing what issues should be taken upon first, um, as well as setting the goal of what are environmental issues in the county. Um, the environmental issue stream and community is very broad, uh, making sure that uh, county agencies and entities in the county have the appropriate staff uh, resources and so forth to actually tackle those issues are one of the main concerns of the commission right now. Um, right now, the county council member is also uh, working alongside uh, Councilwoman Jolene Ivey. They, uh, the councilman actually chairs the Health, Human Services, and Public Safety uh, Committee. So right now, we're, we're dealing with a lot of issues that deal with uh, environmental uh, policy as well as uh, public safety, which are kind of intermingled as well. Uh, so I know he's very proud to serve alongside uh, Councilwoman Jolene Ivey, uh, but we're very happy to be here and uh, I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. So just want to uh, kind of lead you out through a discussion uh, to kind of dig deeper into um, issues of importance to stakeholders in the county. Uh, so, Council Member uh, Ivy talked about Bladensburg and the, and the concrete plant and the fact that the, this should be more of a data-driven process. And so, you know, what I've seen the Council do recently, you blocked the permit of the concrete batching plant. You also did not approve the special exception for the uh, fly ash landfill in um, Brandywine. So can y'all talk about how, how have things changed that now these decisions have been made, uh, these positive decisions have been made when they weren't being made, at least in my opinion, maybe not the same kind of uh, same level of focus and the same sort of determination in previous sort of uh, councils? Well, I can only speak for the time that I've been there for the last five years. We take a differential treatment, you know, of cases by by council members, but at the same time, I think we are very open to listening to what is occurring or to the public when they come in and 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 speak their mind. And so that's what and like I said, I bring my own experience to the table. And, and so that's, that's what I could say with regards to that. Okay. I really feel like the most important thing that has happened is times have just changed. Mm -hmm. And w there was a time when there was a lot more, I don't know, you, more deference given to the business community and with this council at least, I can tell you that with the new members and the members who've remained from the previous council, 
Um, I think there's a lot more deference given to the environmental community. There's more awareness, people like you who've been out there leading the fight and raising the issues, we listen. I mean, even if these weren't your issues in the beginning, they better be your issues today. Because, you know, even if you're just looking out for yourself, you're not gonna be reelected if people know that you're not looking out for their health and their well-being. So I think that that's the biggest thing that's changed. And, and to echo what Councilwoman uh, uh, Tavares just said, um, our office is a new office. Um, there has never been an at-large office uh, recently, so we're, we're making sure that we're taking in all issues from all over the county. Uh, one of the goals of the commission is to make sure that we have town halls. Um, we have things set up in place where uh, residents, no matter where in the county, can come out, listen, but also receive information so you all will be informed about what's going on in your neighborhoods. Majority of the time, citizens aren't informed about what's going on in their water, uh, in their local community, and so forth. Being able to be more informed about the problems and things that you all can do on a personal basis, I think will help greatly. Thank you. Uh, so the next question, so I'm not a big fan of the commission, uh, Chris, the EJ commission. And I'm, I know I'm on it. Um, so, and, and, and those of you know in the room know, I'm also not a big fan of the statewide commission either. So what, one of the things I didn't say, and you know, I, I typically try to be nice and I put everybody on, put anybody on blast, but I will give you all a little bit of background. Not, not for the commission, but in general. We invited um, every county council member to, to be on this panel. Now, not everybody's be on it, but we invite everybody. When it comes to statewide discussion, we invited every secretary of every agency in our state. We invited the, the EJ Commission chair and every member. We invited the Climate Change Commission chair and every member to be here. So, and also to participate in the state discussion. So you can see if our folks here, I don't think they're here. Now, you can, they can raise their hands later and say, Dr. Wilson, we are here. But that, to me, shows whether or not this is a forum where we want to talk about what are you doing on these issues and hold folks accountable. So the reason why we're here, and I want to give a shout out, and I'll come back to the question, and I'll come back to the commission uh, point. The reason why we're here, in North Carolina, they have an annual EJ summit. And at that annual summit, they have state agency folks come in and report back, what are you doing to address environmental justice? The folks who are politicians and policymakers, they come give feedback on what are you doing to address environmental justice, injustice. And so this is a, been modeled after what they've been doing for over 20 years. So this is actually the first time at this event that we're actually having this feedback kind of accountability discussion. And so I just want to put that, put that out there. Now, getting back to the point about the commission, again, I'm not going to say too much bad stuff about it. But what I want to say is, and the, the, the frame it positively, how do you think the commission or a different commission, and not, maybe not a commission, how do you think the county could be more uh, accountable and have a better um, sort of uh, vision for addressing environmental justice? Does the county need to have an environmental justice plan? You know, so can y'all get some feedback, some thoughts about how we can do a better job of having a plan, an implementation of a plan when it comes to environmental justice? So what happened in Bladensburg you wouldn't have to fight against that because that will be seen as a use that's not actually, uh, it's incongruent with our vision. What's happening in Brandywine, just a uh, commuter, commuter grade might not be here today, but Brandywine has three power plants in the three mile radius. One is currently in operation, two that are being built, gas fire plants. Let me tell you all about gas and natural gas. When you burn natural gas, what do you get? Combustion byproducts. So don't let the smooth taste fool you about natural gas. It's still it's highly problematic. Brandywine also has the fly ash landfill. Brandywine has a Superfund site. Brandywine has a sludge lagoon. Brandywine has 3,500 diesel truck trips per day. Brandywine also takes in contaminated dirt from DC. Brandywine has become a sacrifice zone for our county and also for the region. So if you had an EJ plan for the county, Brandywine would not have happened, okay? Brandywine is also unincorporated. So y'all know what the saying is, 
when you're unincorporated is what? Contamination without what? Representation. Okay? So I just want to speak, I'm going to put that out there as it relates to how can we do a better job to make sure we don't have another Bernie wine in our county? And I just said a lot, but that was for the setup for the question. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Dr. Wilson. Yeah, go ahead. Um, that, that's, that's a pretty substantial question, so I'll try to answer this uh, to the best of my knowledge from the councilman's perspective and, and from the work that we've been doing. Um, we don't believe that there is enough um, communication between uh, entities in the county, agencies, and so forth going on. Um, when that happens, things fall through the cracks. You're obviously not going to catch everything that goes on in Bladensburg and in the southern part of the county, in any area of the county. So we believe that more intergovernmental cooperation between agencies may be a benefit of that. Uh, but we also believe that there needs to be more transparency going on. Uh, we don't believe that citizens in the county are informed enough about what's going on and to that extent, uh, some of the issues that they could possibly prevent. Uh, it's not that the citizens in our county aren't concerned. I think they're just uninformed, uninformed. So I think making sure that there is a level, a better level of transparency uh, with a better level of accountability when it comes to actually allowing um, certain proposals and, and so forth from actually coming to fruition is definitely needed. Okay, thank you. You know, there, there are so many things in our county that are affected by the state government or the federal government. So I'm looking at MAGLAV right now, and I see- Could you explain what that is? MAGLAV is a, is a proposal that um, our federal government is actually considering that would be a transit, high-speed transit, it would stop first at the BWI, at the airport, and then to Baltimore, and then ultimately, I believe the goal is to go to New York. So I can see there, there can be benefits to that. There are some people who support it, um, but most people in Prince George's don't because we bear the impact of the whole project, but we don't really get anything out of it, so it's kind of hard to, for us to support it. Yeah, it's coming from Union Station, so it's going to go underground and, and then what? <laughs> so in any event, um, but that's a decision that all we can do is yell about it. I mean, we didn't even know about it until about a year ago, and it's something that's been going. And so when I saw uh, Senator Carton came to speak to the council last week, and I asked him about Maglev because he's the one who will have the greatest impact on that decision going forward and people yell at the council and I can't I'm not going to say it's not us it's not us but you know what it's not us I mean you have to know who to yell at so when it comes to maglav you have to yell at the federal partners when it comes to power plants you got to yell at the state partners so you have to know the right people to yell at for the council though the things that we can do uh, have to do with land use that we do control. And I believe we can have a significant impact and having an en environmental justice plan would help fulfill that. But uh, you know, you have to know where to make an impact where you are. And what we can do is, you know, hold people accountable who are in the positions that can make those decisions. Um, and we do all need to raise awareness about what's happening in Brandywine. It's really outrageous if you think about it. They have three coal power plants in a, in a very short, in a small area. Pardon me? Isn't it three or is it's it It's one coal and two gas. Okay. Yeah. Well, these, these plants are all close to each other. They're all emitting, and the kids down there are breathing that air. So when you, and, you know, it's ridiculous. So even though that is kind of far from my district, I can't put my head in the sand and say it doesn't matter because it's not District 5. That'd be ridiculous. You know, we all rise and fall together. We all breathe together, and we have to make sure that all of us are looking out for all of us. Thank you. So for me, I, I agree with everything that's been said by my colleagues and here. What I think that I take an approach is I'm more of a bread and butter issue at the, at the same time. For me, I try to think about what does it mean to have 
the purple line coming right through my district and the impact of gentrification that I could potentially have and improving connectivity. What does it mean for a lot of the poor people that I represent uh, who may not have transportation? The fact that, you know, we had at one point the highest pedestrian deaths and at an intersection at University and, and, um, and New Hampshire in the entire state of Maryland at one point. And so we've been able to, to work on real tangible projects that, that make a difference. So that means creating the transit station where we have the largest concentration um, of, of people taking buses, that's saving lives. We have uh, eight new bike share racks all throughout to help in first mile, last mile uh, transportation for individuals and trying to improve the roadways to include cycling and bike, bike sharing and, and all that. So we have eight new stations all throughout my, my, my district and we're bringing 25 new stations throughout the county uh, for next year. So those are, I mean, it may not seem like for me, like in, illegal dumping is huge. So that means that I created a bill for an environmental crimes unit. Now we're putting cameras to catch predators who are coming in to dump in our areas. And we just caught one um, and we just made a big deal out of it. It's, it was in the news. So we took them in handcuffs and people are getting the message. So those are the kind of things that it may not seem like the big fight with Maglev or Hyperloop or, or, or a power plant, but at the same time, I mean, we have the, for me, the biggest issue is that I, I need eight schools. We we're, we're, our kids are going to school in travel trailers right now. We have over a hundred travel trailers. Half of them have been there for almost 50 years. And what does that mean? What, what message does that send to the children that go to school in the streets, literally? When they have to go to the bathroom, they gotta put their coat on and go to the streets in order to go um, and attend to their needs. So what that speaks to me is that when I try to put a school in a particular neighborhood, there was equal nimbyism there. They said it was an environmental justice issue and they, we, they kicked the school out. They felt that there were too many schools in that particular neighborhood. And so, so those are the issues that I have to confront with. No, and I appreciate you talking about, you know, bread and butter issues. I mean, and, and this will be my last question and I'll give y'all time to kind of sum up your, your final thoughts and then we go to the next, uh, the state panel. Um, but So you got issues, uh, bread and butter issues around food food issues, food access issues, and also bread and butter issues. I think, you know, water quality issues. We have schools in our county that have lead. So can y'all speak to, uh, I mean, you think about, you know, Flint, y'all heard me say how we're gonna put our, America first and put our kids first. Kids exposed to lead, that's irreversible, right? You putting the cap on that potential. Uh, the, the future scientists, I mean, the future, somebody even bigger and better than me, the future Jacoby Wilsons, I'm just being bad. The future scientists, the docs and lawyers out there, that potential is being capped because of lead exposure. So can y'all speak quickly to the issues of food access and how the counties are address that? That's an that's a environmental justice issue, and lead is an environmental justice issue. Well, I'll, I'll talk about, I'll, I'll say quickly on my end what we're working on. In terms, of, in terms of lead issues, we have a money set aside to help houses, uh, single family homes renovate to address that issue. I am pushing in the budget right now as we speak money to set aside for multifamily housing, which also has that particular, that product does not exist. Mm -hmm. And so those are the things on, on food access. I, I can say that while we may not have as much of an issue in the Northern area, we have, we have a cultural barrier. A lot of, a lot of the African-Americans like to go to shoppers. They don't like to go to Mega Mart. And even though we have a lot of, you know, we have Best Way and Mega Mart, they're catering to an ethnic market because that's the overwhelming majority of folks. They may not be the ones that are the top voter getter, but they are the majority in population that exists 
in the district. And so we have to be able to, we have a lot of, we're trying to bring more food mar uh, of urban farms, mm. food markets. That's the legislation that we're passing right now and that I've, I've put in place where we're, we're in the process of, of it's going into committee uh, in, in June. So those are the kind of things um, that I'm working on. I'm working on in terms of food accessibility and and um, okay, thank you. Other issue. Any others want to comment on that real quick? Well, I'm I have a bill that I'm about to introduce that it's a result of a very large work group on food trucks, and you know, as you know, we've had um, quite an evolution in food trucks in this county. They um, there was a time when people really objected to them. And I really felt like it was racism mm -hmm. because a lot of the food trucks that we had were basically pupusa trucks. And so believe me, I, re I represent a lot of, of uh, older black people who are really pissed off about the Latinos that they took it out on the food trucks. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that, they were banned in the county. It wasn't just the pupusa trucks, but it was largely that. So, um, there, there was legislation put in by the last council that brought food trucks back in a very limited way. And I understand why it was so limited because after you've gone through the hell of the pupusa truck fight, you really wanna be careful coming back. So they, uh, they did it with these hubs and um, it hasn't been entirely successful. We've had some food trucks come back, but if you ever go into DC or you go into Montgomery County, they're much more prevalent. And um, there are statewide legislation that now allows uh, there to be some reciprocity um, as far as health department licensing. And so one thing that we're doing in this legislation is lowering our fees so that Maybe some of those uh, Montgomery County uh, trucks will, would rather come and, and get their licensing done here because it'll be less costly for them than to do it in Montgomery County. And we're also in the legislation that's being proposed, uh, eliminating the hubs and putting different uh, criteria into effect so we can have greater accessibility to food trucks. Now, these food trucks will also have a healthy component, uh, trucks that carry certain kinds of healthy food who serve areas that are food deserts will be able to eliminate their fees altogether. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is something that I'm working on. We want to eventually in the next step, because you know these things take time, to have basically farmers markets slash food trucks to be able to do the same thing in these um, underserved areas. So that's what I'm doing when it comes to accessibility. When it comes to things like lead, I'll have the good sense to support Denny Tavares' legislation to, um, to eliminate lead in people's homes, wherever they live. Thank you. Go ahead, Chris. And, and I'll speak very uh, briefly. Um, the councilman, of course, is is on the side of uh, both of these council members right here. We want to support all initiatives that takes any type of lead out of the water. I mean, it, it's, um, it's almost unreal when you think about it that we even have to deal with this type of issue. Um, the councilman is also very open to making sure that he supports different initiatives to bring not only food into the county, but healthy food. I think that's a big concern. We don't only just want to have a McDonald's on every street corner or a Arby's. We want to make sure that we have uh, proper organic foods that our, our county residents are consuming and won't have to worry about a health disparity 5, 10, 15 years down the line. Uh, so I, I would like to echo what both of these council members have said already. Uh, the council member is in, in very much support of all these initiatives. Thank you. No, thanks for that. And just as a you know recommendation, I think from stakeholders in the room who live in the county, and also things we talked about before, it will be good as just to kind of go back to a comment that was made. I think you made, Chris, more collaboration across county agencies. So we should see the planning, working with the health department and working with the department of environment. It doesn't make any sense that that doesn't happen. But we know in this room, for many of us who are dealing with the federal EPA, it happens at that level too. So there's a problem at the federal level 
at the state level and county level, uh, folks working together. Because in the end, the folks that are most impacted are believing that you are working together, right? And so having those agencies work together with the county council and with the uh, executive's office would be great. And have some type of MOA where we're going when these issues come up, we're going to work more together to make sure we have these principles of equity in what we do, right? And another thing I want to offer is the School of Public Health, University of Maryland, y'all should hold us accountable and call on us more to make sure we're helping you out when it comes to giving you the data that you need when it comes to your decision making. So I just want to say that. And just to close out, I want to give you like each a minute to kind of give you closing thoughts about, you know, what your plans are, you know, uh, moving forward to make sure that we address environmental justice in our county and, in, and all, our, all of our residents can benefit uh, from living in healthy, uh, green, and uh, equitable communities. Well, before I just close out, I just want to recognize Ramon Palencio Cabo from Chispa. He was instrumental in working with me to get um, the Volkswagen settlement monies into to into our schools to, so that we could buy electric bus vehicles for the children so that the buses don't sit idle. So those are like like I said, real tangible issues that work. Um, so with that, I just want to say that I just want to be able to be sure that we're working together, that we're not pitting one community against the other, and that we're bridging communities the way in my district we were able to uh, create the Northern Gateway and be able to co connect communities, the African American community with the Latino community and try to bridge that gap because that's the cause of a lot of the friction that we see in, in at least in my community. And what that means is be able to educate folks in terms of the illegal dumping that's happening in terms of, you know, just the, the common, like I said, bread and butter issues that are happening in the greater scheme of things. You know, I'm, I'm extremely supportive of environmental justice issues throughout the county because it's, it's a benefit to us all. And so we have to be mindful of, of our decisions and the impacts of our decisions. So with that, um, I'll continue working with you, continue to hold the, the public health uh, department accountable and, and co you continue to hold us accountable. That's yes. what we're here for. And it's a pleasure to serve you all. Thank, Thank you. you. I really want to thank Dr. Sokobi Wilson, who's been such a leader on this issue, and I really appreciate having met him. Um, Antonia Bookbinder's here, and she's the one who actually connected us, I don't know, a couple of years ago, I guess, so I, I really appreciate that. And, um, and Denise Hamler, who has been just such a leader on fighting against the concrete batching plant. All that is to say that I think it's incumbent upon us up here to make sure that we're listening to the right people and that we're working with you. And to the extent that you have other ideas, things that you need to, uh, to bring to our attention, I hope that you will. Um, I think that we're all pretty easy to reach, so uh, please reach out because, you know, we can't do this alone. We need you to help us get things done for the whole community. Thanks so much. Thank you. Our office, one of the first um, approaches that we take is to always see things as a countywide issue. This is one county. Uh, we see everything that goes on in all the districts as a very important vital matter. With that said, um, our office kind of takes a countywide legislative approach. We want to make sure that everything that is going on in the northern, central, southern part of the county gets the attention it deserves. Um, as Dr. Wilson said, there needs to be more transparency with intergovernmental um, actions and agencies. Uh, that's one of our approaches to make sure that we work closely with the Department of Health, the Department of the Environment, and making sure that we tackle the gaps that even if um, uh, a, a preemption type of stake does approach the council, making sure that we tackle the gaps that the council can tackle. Um, even though we can't handle all the issues, we can handle some of the issues, and just finding those gaps in between is what's critical right now. Uh, Want to make sure that we're doing our best to hear everyone out. Um, the council member is planning on having town halls in various parts of the county. 
We want to make sure that when we have these town halls, you all come out. You all tell us the issues. We don't just want to hear issues uh, from certain organizations. We want to hear it from every county resident that lives here. So making sure that you all participate in anything that the county council is doing is vital. Uh, so you all can feel free to meet with me, anyone from our office, um, and anyone from the county council that can assist with your concerns. We would be happy to take those on. Thank you so much. Thank you. Let's thank our panel again. Thank you. Be careful.